Welcome to Gladwin Free Methodist Church. Here's Pastor Steve Decker with From Death to Life, Living in Community. The last few weeks we've been taking a look at, uh, at our own spiritual journey in light, of, uh, in light of the journey of the Israelites uh, under the leadership of Moses and as they, as they follow God out of slavery uh, from Egypt and to the point uh, where they had to make a decision, am I going to trust God and step forward into this, this vast unknown, the sea in front of me? Or am I going to be consumed and defeated and, and essentially killed by my old life? And uh, the Israelites chose as a, as a collective, as a group of people, to step forward uh, in faith. And as we saw, as we remembered or maybe learned for the first time, uh, that, uh, that God was faithful to them and parted the waters of the sea that they could pass through safely into new life. Uh, and a new life uh, in him and through him. Uh, and yet that did not make their journey smooth. That did not make their journey uh, uh, quick or expeditious or easy in any way, shape, or form. It also did not mean that, uh, that in their journey uh, they stayed completely faithful to and, and followed God completely and were obedient to God completely, yet they were his people. And much like that, we are a people who, uh, who in this, this, this culture, this time, of, uh, of everyone struggling to form an identity and, and choosing all these crazy terms to identify themselves. We are a people who, uh, if we want an identity, we are redeemed, right? Uh, Jesus came, he lived, he died, he rose again uh, because you and I have value, have worth to him. That informs or should inform how we look at ourselves, how we consider uh, ourselves, how we treat ourselves, how we live, but it also should inform uh, how we act and treat one another. Because see that that person, uh, not only the people that you love and hold dear to you, uh, are redeemed and are of worth, but the people that, that really bother you or the types of people that really bother you and uh, maybe you say, well, I really can't stand uh, so-and-so. I really can't stand these types of people. See, they are people uh, who have been redeemed as well. They are people for whom Jesus lived, died, and rose again every bit as much as he did for you and I. And that's a tough reality for us to deal with, right? It's easy to like certain people. And we all know it's difficult to like others. It's easy to treat certain people with dignity and respect, but it's really difficult to treat others in that fashion. And so we are a people who are redeemed. For those of us who, uh, who stood with the vast unknown before us and uh, the old sinful life behind us ready to devour us and stepped out in faith and followed God, we are a people who are saved. We don't use that word much anymore, which is a shame. But we are a people who are saved. Saved from what? Saved from that old life, that sinful life, that, that, that life that uh, would seek to devour and destroy and ultimately kill us. In some instances physically, in all instances kill us spiritually. And so as we are redeemed and some of us are, are, are saved... Then we continue on our journey, and it's not a journey of ease or perfection, just like the Israelites did not have a journey of ease uh, or perfection. It's a journey where there are times where uh, we are the rebellious child against God, right? Something happens and we have an ugly moment. Something happens, we have an ugly season, 
right? Sometimes, sometimes in that journey, in the midst of it, uh, we just sense or feel like this, this distance from God, or, or we sense or feel like there's an absence uh, of God in our lives as well. Sometimes it's clear we're, we're, we're going forward and, and, and we're growing in his image and we just feel so close to him and it is awesome. And sometimes it feels like we're literally circling the drain. And that really represents the way the journey of the Israelites but more importantly, I want you to know and understand as you sit here today uh, in the midst of your own journey that you are not alone. That is the spiritual journey of all who choose to follow God. Why? Well, we're human. We're stubborn people, right? Sometimes we need to go through some stuff. Sometimes we need to go through some stuff to learn. Sometimes we need to go through some stuff to be, to be humbled, right? And so as we look at, uh, we look at the reality of, of the Israelites on their journey, picking up where we left off last week, somewhere between uh, the sea and the promised land, in the midst of that, Moses their leader had some ugly, spiritually desolate times as well. He had times where, you know, he was trying to, to, to manage this large group of people that numbered uh, somewhere between 800,000 and 1.5 million, depending on whose, whose studies you look at. And in that instance, finally, he listened to the advice of his father-in-law, which that might be unique right there, going to an in-law for advice. But anyway, he listened to the advice of his father-in-law and, and began to put some structures and organization in place, placing, uh, placing people of wisdom and knowledge and maturity uh, in positions of leadership and responsibility. And some order came about. But as they proceeded, disorder came about as well, people being people, right? Moses had some times where he acted in anger. The people had some times where they were ungrateful. And they journeyed, and they journeyed, and the cycle seemed to repeat itself. Until eventually, one day, and uh, I will encourage you to, and I think it's in the bulletin, uh, take a look at and, and spend some time this week reading uh, right directly out of the scripture of this, this experience. It's in the book of Exodus. And uh, uh, read of the ins and outs and the ups and downs and that, and that sort of thing. But ultimately, one day of their journey as they, uh, you know, as they uh, circled sideways full speed ahead, uh, of sorts to ultimately get to the promised land. One day they finally, finally made it there. Only as a result of following God. There were people who, uh, who through this journey, who had left Egypt, but, uh, uh, you know, left slavery in Egypt, but yet didn't make it. They had passed away along the way. There were people uh, who were born during the, uh, during the journey uh, that never experienced slavery in Egypt, but yet made it to the promised land. And so this was a group of people who were uh, regenerating of sorts. Uh, and ultimately, they did finally make it to the promised promised land. They made it there. And that leaves a very real, now what? Right? It's easy as we look at that and we, we lay that into our own uh, spiritual lives, our own spiritual journey. We understand, I hope anyway, that the ultimate promised land for the follower of Jesus is heaven. Right? 
But we're on this journey now. How do we organize? How do we survive? How do we, uh, how do we uh, experience uh, at least some semblance of that promise today? And see, this is where, uh, this is where Jesus was a more perfect redeemer, more perfect leader uh, in this sense than Moses. And that is by God's design. I would encourage you, uh, since we don't have the advantage of the screen, to turn to your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 16. And if you're using the, the Pew Bibles in front of you, that is on page 950, 950. And Jesus, as he understood this reality of, of humankind, this uh, uh, this fact, this reality that our spiritual journey would be anything but a straight line from where we are uh, to the promised land. Uh, Jesus understood that uh, there needed to be a, a, a bit or a taste of the promised land uh, here on earth. And so in this case, in Matthew chapter 16, we're going to read verses 13 through 18. In this case, we see what Jesus instituted as a means for us to experience a taste of, of heaven, the promised land, uh, today in the midst of our journey. And it says, Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do you people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now there's a ton going on here in this account. Uh, and uh, first off, I, it's important to know and understand that this is the first time the first time that, uh, that the disciples or that anyone would have heard or understood the word uh, church, at least used in this sense. It was a new term applied to the spiritual journey. And the word that Jesus spoke, that in English is translated church, means a group of people come together, bound together, by a common purpose. Come together for one common purpose. See, we can go to, to community events where there's a group of people assembled and, and, uh, and, and people are there for differing reasons, differing purposes, right? Usually selfishly motivated. That can, unfortunately, be said of church as it is today as well. But what Jesus was referring to here was, uh, you are church, you are a group of people come together for this purpose of glorifying my name and living and loving in such a way that others are drawn to, to me, to Jesus, to life in Christ. And so Jesus is introducing this term uh, and saying, I will build my church. Jesus will build his church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. See, we get confused sometimes with that and how we live it out, right? Right? especially as pastors, church leaders, sometimes we take on a place upon ourselves responsibility for the church in an unhealthy way. 
and we take and place upon ourselves responsibility for building the church in an unhealthy and unchristlike way. But Jesus is saying, hey, this is my church and I am going to build it. And there's a promise here that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. So we have, a, we have a church, we have a body of people bound together, come together and bound together uh, for the singular purpose of, of glorifying God and loving one another in such a way that people are drawn to him, drawn to life in Christ. And the gates of hell would rebel against that, right? We understand that, uh, that as a holy assembly, the gates of hell, the forces of hell, uh, would be something that are outside the dynamic of church. Yeah? And so, God is saying, hey, this, Jesus is saying, this, this opposing spiritual force that lives outside the church will not overcome the church. And that's an awesome promise, an awesome promise to give us hope. But in that lies a very human reality that as we see uh, various churches fail, uh, and as you break down why they failed, it is not. It is not because Jesus was wrong or failed in this promise. It is because the church was destroyed from the inside not out. Various factors inside the church, people acting in, 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 uh, in self-interest, pushing agendas, failing the mission, that unifying cause or purpose is what destroys churches. They die from the inside out. I think, well, I know, much like every point in time in history, there are critical things, critical social trends that churches, that Christianity faces, that how we as church respond define us, define our impact. And either allow Jesus to build his church or destroy it from the inside. In our day and age, right now, 2019, we deal with and we struggle with this reality of, of, of people uh, trying to figure out their identity, right, and how they identify themselves. We deal with, we struggle with, and I don't see any, any young ones in here aside from Talon. We deal with and we struggle with issues of sexual identity. We deal with and we struggle with various other uh, means or descriptors that uh, society uses to divide rather than unify. And sadly, church as a whole has played into that. Instead of saying and representing and putting forward you have an opportunity to identify with Christ and bring you from death to life, and that is the single most important thing. We sit in meetings and Sunday school classes and sometimes uh, you know, annual conferences and general conferences and decide how are we going to deal with this group of people. And in my mind, I sit and think, how would Jesus deal with them? 
He'd love them radically. Broken people were drawn to him. Broken people ought to be drawn to his church. We don't need to talk about it. We need to love. To share a bit of, of my, my own personal journey with this, I got to tell you, I, I, I chuckle, you know, as, as I was uh, processing and, and, and preparing for this sermon, uh, I thought, wow, this is going to be this is going to be tough, and this is going to make some people uncomfortable, right? And and, and this might ruffle some feathers, but uh, you know, Pastor Phil would agree with this. I'm sure he's experienced it as well. That you know, when your head goes there, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit starts uh, trimming away at your own soul, your own spirit, the areas where you are uh, unhealthy in that regard. And to share my, my own journey with that, um, you know, I'll tell you, I was, I was raised in church. I was raised in the Free Methodist Church. I was raised in the Free Methodist Church at a time because it was a small country church. We, you know, we lagged a little bit behind, but uh, where you didn't play cards and you didn't dance. Probably the toughest question I asked my parents was, would I be able to go to senior prom? And I did, with the most amazing date ever, for what it's worth. But anyway, anyway, um, and with that high, strong focus on, uh, they called it holiness, but the focus really at that point is on sin, not holiness, right? With that high, strong focus on sin, we begin to push people away. We begin to push people out of the church, and out of the church means out of the ability to experience uh, Christ in a group of people that is encouraging and supportive and helps you along the path. And I grew up as a teenager, I can, I can remember, um, boy, I despise it now. Uh, but using uh, racial slurs, not that they held anything against uh, people of different ethnicities, but it was just a common part of my vernacular, and it was horrible. And I remember uh, looking at people whom I didn't understand, be it people in, the, in, in, uh, in a lifestyle of homosexuality or, uh, or people who... Um, uh, struggled with other things and was very judgmental and condemning to that because I didn't understand it. And, you know, boy, I could cite the scripture that said it was wrong, that it was sinful. And then as my walk with God became more of a walk of surrender, thankfully, the scales fell away from my eyes, and I began to see people a bit like he sees people. And I began to understand that, uh, that, that you know, hey, everybody is of value. You know, and as certain, certain things, uh, and, and please, I'm not keying in on homosexuality, but it is an issue of this era uh, that, uh, that we, we deal with, and it tends to frame how we approach and our mindset towards other ways, uh, other, um, uh, other uh, behaviors or attitudes or, or sins that we don't understand. Uh, but as, you know, in the case of, of, of homosexuality, uh, the, the lifestyle had a face in the form of a cousin whom I loved dearly, who was like a sister to me. And one of the single most fantastic human beings you could ever meet. Not that I changed my understanding of what God's word said, says about it. 
but I saw people differently. I understood that, you know, there, it's easy to overlook my own sin and condemn sin in the lives of others, right? Uh, we probably all have been there, maybe live there to a certain extent today. Yet I also began to understand that uh, with, with, with certain people, uh, probably all of us, in the grips of sin, much of it is driven out of brokenness and confusion from the life that we've lived. And as we look at the reality of church, you know, I was blessed to experience church my entire life. And I can remember uh, the small country church three quarters of a mile up the road from the house I grew up in. Uh, and as a teenager, having a key to the church, uh, the front door of the church, that uh, when I needed that alone time with God, I could flee to that place, understanding that it was just a building, right? Uh, but it was a building where I had come to know and experience the presence of God and what I needed to express experience the presence of God, when I needed that alone time in prayer, I could come, I could collapse at the altar, and I could meet with him at any point in time. And I know as, as a pastor, I have that access, that, that ability to do likewise now. Right when I need to identify uh, identify God as being associated in a, in a physical space, I can flee to that physical space, and I can fall before Him. I can freely walk in these doors on Sunday morning, and be greeted warmly by each and every one of you. And I am so blessed for that. But if we're being honest, church, because of the collective of our own mindsets and our inability or perhaps unwillingness to see others the way God sees others, that reality isn't true for so many people. It is difficult, difficult, to even consider walking through the doors of a church building. And when, by whatever means, that happens, it is scary and terrifying to see how people interact. It is hard. To not be greeted warmly. Every look, whether it's intended to or not, feels judgmental. And it is far too often a traumatic experience. Church, for those of you today who are Christ followers, part of our identity as followers of Christ is to be ambassadors of him, to share his love to people who need to experience it. To share his love with those who are, uh, who are bound by addiction. To share his love with those who, uh, who are uh, uh, living a, a, a homosexual or any sort of LGBTQ, I think I got that right, um, uh, dynamic. Uh, for those who uh, are struggling financially or for those who, who are at the opposite end of the wealth spectrum. That's a lonely place, too. We all need Christ's love. 
everyone in that dynamic needs to experience the love of Christ the way you have. And it is my assignment, it is your assignment to do just that. Gladwin Free Methodist Church. We need to be a faith community in this town and in this county and in this region where people know they can walk in the doors and be loved, not judged, not condemned, but loved. It may be difficult for you to have perspective on how we're doing. It's difficult for me to have perspective on how we're doing with that as a church. But you can evaluate and have perspective on how you are doing with that as a person. And how you are doing with that as a person probably is a really good indicator of how you are doing with that as a church. See, it's easy to get hung up, and before you, uh, before you sit here and think, well, Pastor Steve's going weak on sin, I'm not. It's easy to get uh, hung up, so hung up, on the, what the Scripture says about sin that we totally live a life that misrepresents how Jesus lived in light of broken people. We get so caught up in the black and white of Scripture that we fail to live out the reality of Scripture. For those who are Christ followers, there is a moment, there is a time of evaluation in light of this reality. You know, Jesus, as we looked at this passage in Matthew, Jesus starts this interaction by asking a question. Who do people say the Son of Man is? And then he drills in a little bit deeper and says to his disciples, his followers, who do you say I am? It's a question. Who do you say Jesus is? If, like Peter, you say he is the Christ, the Messiah, and as one of his disciples, one of his followers, the right answer, the only response, is to live as he did where you sit and dine with broken people and broken people are drawn to you and because of your love that is an extension of Christ's love they continue to be drawn to you and are drawn to Christ disciples Jesus followers who do you say he is? Not with your mouth, but with your actions. Who do you say he is? With your interactions with others. Who do you say he is? When you're sitting next to or across the table from a seriously broken individual who maybe maybe is just ensnared by that sin and that sinful lifestyle that you can't understand and you despise. Do your actions, does your love say as one of his followers that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the way from death to life? Or do your actions push people away? 
For those of you here today who are not yet, have not made a decision to follow Jesus, you're still standing at, at that sea wondering about the great unknown. Know that. Understand that. Life in Christ is living with and experiencing and giving a radical, unprecedented love that is life-changing, that is life-giving. It draws people in. It doesn't push people away. It frees people from sin. It doesn't encourage them to claim an identity based on their sin. If you're standing at that sea, I would encourage you, come on in. Come on in. Because to walk in the midst of that love and to give that love, to be an extension of that love, is the most amazing thing you can ever experience. To be in partnership with Jesus and bringing people from death to life is phenomenal. As we wrap up this morning, I'm going to ask the praise team to come up. Uh, I'd like us to sing, uh, Come As You Are. It speaks exactly to what we're talking about today. Christ followers, disciples. Man, if you've been in a place where you recognize that you've been putting forward an altered image of Jesus, a changed image of Jesus that pushes people away. You need to repent. You need to repent. Go to him from your pew. Uh, come forward. You need to repent. If you're standing at the sea and, and unsure of what to do, There's a community here who loves you. There's a community here who will help you in that journey that's circling full speed ahead. Come forward. Step into the sea. We're here with you.